Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich, and I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, and the DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to another in our continuing series of virtual author events. We are so pleased tonight to present these two fantastic, talented poets, and we can't wait to get started. I would like to remind you, though, of a few things before we begin tonight's event. First, if you would like to ask a question, feel free to type it either into the Q&A section or into the chat section, and we will go ahead and curate and read those questions in turn after the formal presentation. Also, we have um, allowed closed caption feature is now turned on. So if you do need closed captioning, feel free to find that located either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device, and turn those on from there. Also, if you would like to order a copy of the book tonight, our bookseller is Karis Books and More here in Decatur, Georgia, and we'll drop a link in the chat so you can directly order from them. We absolutely support all of our independent bookstores who have done so much during this pandemic to make sure that we're receiving books by mail, curbside pickup, and in some cases, they will even deliver books to our doorsteps. So we encourage you, no matter where you are joining us from for this event, to order from your local independent bookstore, especially the black owned and independent bookstores, because we truly believe that supporting those independent bookstores help us to build a just country and diversify our literary community. Just a few notes for the rest of the week and for upcoming events, tomorrow night, Tuesday, June 29th, we do have our final Jocelyn Jackson Summer Reading Series event for 2021. This is featuring Caitlin Greenwich, who's written the book Liberty, and Kirsten Valdez Quaid, who's written the book The Five Wounds. Of course, you can sign up for that event on Eventbrite, as, as well as all of our other events that we have coming up. I would like to say that we do have an event on July 1st with Kate Moore for her new book, the Woman They Could Not Silence. If you remember, Kate Moore was here several years ago for her book, The Radium Girls, that went on to become an internationally best-selling book. And she had such a wonderful time. She's coming back. And if you order a book through Eagle Eye Books for that event, she has sent signed book plates that will be included in all of those book orders for you. I would also like to mention two poetry events that we have coming up since I would assume that we are all lovers of poetry at this event this evening. Our first is on July 26th, and it is part of our Poetry Atlanta Presents program. This is of course curated by Poetry Atlanta Incorporated and typically hosted by Colin Kelly. On the 26th, we will be featuring three poets, including Aruni Kashap, Andrea Jurevich, and Tiana Nobile. So you can find the sign-up link for that on Eventbrite as well. And then on August 2nd, we do have a very special program coming up. Georgia is part of the Route One Reads program. Route One Reads is a consortium of all the state centers for the book along the East Coast. There are 16 participating states, and this is our fifth year of this particular summer reading program. This particular year, we have picked poetry as the uh, books that we are reading this year. We are so very pleased Peach State by Adrian Sue is the Georgia choice for the Route One Reads. And of those 16 participating states, we have 11 states that will be participating in a live poetry event. Some states will be submitting um, video ahead of time and some we will have video backup just in case the live feed fails our poets. Um, we've heard that some of them maybe in far flung out of the way places, gaining inspiration and writing more poetry. So just in case that video fails, we will have a backup. But we will feature poets from Virginia, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Maine, the District of Columbia, South Carolina, and of course our poet here in Georgia. So we do hope that you will join us for that August 2nd event. It's not posted yet, but we will have that posted this week so you can sign up. Of course, you can find all of our events on Eventbrite, you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter and that will get you the most up-to-date information as well as have all the links so you can sign up for our programs. And if you've ever missed a program of ours, you can of course find us on YouTube. We do have a YouTube channel and whenever you watch a video, we do ask you to like, subscribe, and of course, turn on the notifications. There's several wonderful series 
on that YouTube channel, including the Jocelyn Jackson Summer Reading Series. And the book is Art Events, which we will be doing another series of those coming this August as well. Right now, I'd like to get to our featured event this evening. Poetry is, of course, an evocative, endearing form of expression. Combined within the structures of haiku, sonnet, villanelle, and free verse, these rhymes and lines give form to loss, longing, and love. Implicit in poetry is the idea that we are deepened by heartbreaks, by the recognition and the understanding of suffering, not just our own suffering, but also the pain of others. We are not so much diminished as we are enlarged by grief, by our refusal to vanish, to let others vanish without leaving a record. And poets are people who are determined to leave a trace in words, to transform the oceanic depths of feeling into art that speaks to others. In 100 Poems to Break Your Heart, poet and advocate Edward Hirsch selects 100 poems from the 19th century to the present and illuminates them, unpacking context and references to help the reader fully experience the depth of emotion and wisdom within these poems. Edward Hirsch is a celebrated poet and a tireless advocate for poetry. He was born in Chicago in 1950. And as you will see tonight, his accent will make it impossible for him to hide that fact. He was educated at Grinnell College and at the University of Pennsylvania, where he received his doctorate in folklore. His devotion to poetry is lifelong. He has received numerous awards and fellowships, including a MacArthur Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, an Ingram Merrow Foundation Award, a Pablo Neruda Presidential Medal of Honor, the Prix de Rome, and an Academy of Arts and Letters Award. In 2008, he was elected the Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. The author of five prose books, Hirsch's first collection of poems, For the Sleepwalkers, received the Delmore Schwartz Memorial Award from New York University and the Levan Younger Poets Award from the Academy of American Poets. His second collection, Wild Gratitude, won the National Book Critics Circle Award. And since then, he has published eight additional books and poems, including The Night Parade, Earthly Measures, Special Order, Living Fire, New and Selected Poems, which brings together 35 years of poems, and Gabriel, a poem, a book-length elegy for his son. Hirsch taught for six years in the English department at Wayne State University and 17 years in the creative writing program at the University of Houston. He has been the president of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation since 2002. Our other featured poet is Ilya Kaminsky, who was born in Odessa, the former Soviet Union in 1977, and arrived in the United States in 1993 when his family was granted asylum by the American government. He is the author of Deaf Republic and Dancing in Odessa, and is the co-editor and co-translated many other books, including Echo Anthology of International Poetry and The Dark Elderberry Branch, poems from Marina Svetieva. His work won the Los Angeles Times Book Award, the Ansfield Wolf Book Award, the National Jewish Book Award, the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Whiting Award, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Metcalf Award, the Lennon Fellowship, Academy of American Poets Fellowship, the NEA Fellowship, Poetry Magazine's Levinson Prize, and was also shortlisted for the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Newstat International Literary Prize, and the T.S. Eliot Prize. Deaf Republic was the New York Times Notable Book for 2019, and was also named the best book of 2019 by dozens of other publications, including the Washington Post, The Guardian, The Irish Times, Vanity Fair, Library Journal, and The New Statesman. His poems have been translated into over 20 languages, and his books are published in many countries, including China, where his poetry was awarded the Yun Chen International Poetry Prize. In 2019, Kaminsky was selected by the BBC as one of the 12 artists that changed the world. His work has, he has worked as a law clerk for the San Francisco Legal Aid and the National Immigration Law Center. More recently, he, co he worked pro bono as the court appointed special advocate for orphan children in Southern California. Currently, he holds the Bourne Chair in Poetry at the Georgia Institute of Technology. So please join me to welcome Edward Hirsch and Ilya Kaminsky. Gentlemen. Thank you, Joe. Greetings, Ilya. You're 
You're muted. Yeah, is it better? Yes, great, thank uh, hello. you. Hello. Very glad to see you. Hello, uh, everyone. Um, very glad to be here. Thank you for the Georgia Center for the book, for hosting us. Um, I'm so glad to have Ilya with me. I'm presenting my book tonight, 100 Poems to Break Your Heart. Um, it's sort of a hybrid book. Uh, it's, it's a hybrid book. It's a cross between an anthology and a close reading of 100 poems, a gathering. Um, but the stories are so steep and sorrowful. And the transformations are so complete that um, I think it sort of breaks the, breaks the genre in a way. I think we're somewhat immature about grief in the United States. We're very troubled by it and we want people to get over it immediately. We wanna divide it up into stages, for people to heal so they go back to being normal. I'm all for healing, but I believe that before you heal, you have to mourn. And poets are not afraid of grief. They've always celebrated grief as a central emotion. I myself have often in my life as a, in my life and in my practice as a poet, turned to other poems of grief for consolation and inspiration. And what I've tried to do here is to put together a hundred poems that have been meaningful to me and to say something meaningful about them. And I write about them or try to in ways that honor them as human documents. Because every one of these poems has a steep story behind it. These are poems of real grief. They're not just language games. They're poems that people wrote because they'd suffered something and needed to, to confront it. But they're also poems, they're not diary entries. They're made things. The oldest word for poetry in Greek is poesis, which means making. A poet is a maker and a poem is a made thing. And so in this book, I've tried to write about these poems in a way that honors them as human documents while also unpacking them as poems, as constructed things, keeping these two things in balance and suspension. I hope the poems speak to people in their lives, and I hope that in talking about them, it helps illuminate something about them. So what I was hoping to do tonight is that, um, have, having Ilya with me, that we could read some of the poems and talk about them um, in ways that are interesting to us and say something about why we think they're so meaningful. Um, when I was in my, my early 20s, I discovered the poetry of Eastern Europe. Um, and those poets have meant a great deal to me, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited to have Ilya here, um, because Ilya shares my enthusiasm for so many of these poets. Um, the Polish poets, Czesław Miłosz and Zbigniew Herbert and Wisława Zimborska, and the Hungarian poet Miklos Rodnati, the Turkish poet Nazem Hikmet, and a host of others, the, the Romanian poet Rose Oslinder, and others, and also the Russian poet Anak Madova. So since I have Ilya, I was hoping that Ilya might say something about Anak Madova or Eastern European poetry and then read us the Akhmatova poem that I've chosen in Russian, since he can do that and we can't. Ilya? Yeah, thank you so much, Edward, for having me here today with you. Um, if, if I can have a moment to just thank you, not just for today, but for, I don't know, the last 20 years almost. Um, I was a freshman in college when I first uh, came to Puerto Rican where Edward Hodge was reading in Rochester, New York. And he was a famous poet and I was a college freshman. 
And he sat me down and talked to me about poems and he kept talking for the last 20 years. And that's an amazing act of university. And um, I'm, not, I'm not just speaking for myself, everyone who is picking up this book uh, or many other books that uh, Edward Hoy had published over the years know um, that we do have beloved poets in this country and other countries, uh, few and far between and yet, uh, poets like Edward Hirsch, whose work is truly beloved by many readers. But we don't have a lot of poets who are that generous in their spirit to talk about other poets, to share the world of poetry, to share the large knowledge of poetry, and to truly um, ask important questions about what poetry does. And uh, Edward Hirsch had been doing this for as long as I had been a poet. And I have been learning and I keep learning. So it's truly an honor to be here with you today. Uh, having said that, I have been given a charge to read Ahmadova, so I'll do that. Um, this is from um, a poem that was written in 1940, right before the beginning of um, World War I, and right after the most terrible years of Stalin's terror. Uh, it's written in memory of Bulgakov, the great prose writer, uh, was a master and Margarita. Anna Matava, Pamichi, M. A. Bulgakova. What that I yet he be? Zemian Magil Nehros, Zemian Kadil Nevakurenia. The tax rover drill da Kamsada news will lick a lebna prisoreni. The bill we know, the Kaknik Toshi Til. И в душевных стенах засыхался, И гостью страшную то сам к себе пустил, И с ней наедине остался. И не от тебя, и все вокруг молчит О скорбной и высокой жизни, Лишь голос мой, как флейта, прозвучит И на твоей безмолвной трезне. О, кто подумать мог, Что половумной мне, мне плакал чешеней погибших, Мне тлечи на медленном огне всех переживших, Все забывших. Придется вспоминать того, кто полный сил И светлых замыслах и воли, Как будто бы вчера со мной говорил, Скрывая дрожь смертельной боли. That's wonderful, Ilya. Thank you. Thank you. There, there are some uh, Ahmadova available on YouTube in her own voice. I don't think this poem, but other poems that people can find. The poem in English is called In Memory of MB. And I'll read it just so that you can understand what, it, what it's saying. It's translated, the translation I'm using is by Stanley Kunitz and Max Hayward. Here is my gift, not roses on your grave, not sticks of burning incense. You lived aloof, maintaining to the end your magnificent disdain. You drank wine and told the wittiest jokes and suffocated inside stifling walls. Alone, you let the terrible stranger in and stayed with her alone. Now you're gone. And nobody says a word about your troubled and exalted life. Only my voice, like a flute, will mourn at your dumb funeral feast. Oh, who would have believed that half-crazed I, I, sick with grief for the buried past, I, smoldering on a slow fire, having lost everything and forgotten all, would be fated to commemorate a man so full of strength and will and bright inventions, who only yesterday, it seems, chatted with me, hiding the tremor of his mortal pain. Ilya, I wanted to ask you something. It strikes me in English that this poem, one of the moving things about it is that she is memorializing someone who is more sophisticated than she is. That she feels inferior 
but there's no one else to do it. Is that your reading of it too? Um, yeah, that's what she says. Um, I think her um, perspective, but that's one thing, although she's widely different poet from Maria Svetaeva, one thing that makes them um, similar in a way is um, they wanted to go back to the folkloric tradition of a violin song. And she's um, echoing that a little bit. I'm the, the woman who cries at funerals, not the high society person. Um, I'm here to uh, memorialize you. So yes, of course, she is um, doing exactly what you're saying, but she's also claiming that tradition, which is much older in some ways than uh, Russian civilization as such. She references the Greek tradition of the flute, mm -hmm. which has been part of the elegiac tradition mm -hmm. as long as there have been elegies in Western literature. So she is taking up the traditional role of the person who's an, who's an elegist. Mm -hmm. The poet is a commemorator, um, in some ways a voice for a much larger country than Russia, which is the country of the dead. It's, um, why do you think she calls him, she doesn't use his name here? Um, well, it is funny because in contemporary editions, uh, they actually say Pamati Bulgakova, which is his full name, which is what I got in, in, a, in a book I have, but uh, when she wrote it, of course, she wouldn't want to mention his name because he wasn't exactly um, appraised by the government kind of writer. It's my sense that he was an unofficial person. Mm -hmm. And so because they can't mourn traditionally, because she can't go to his grave, mm -hmm. all she can do is present the poem. That's her gift instead of the funeral itself, because there is no funeral, no public acknowledgement. And some of the poems she had published um, even before the death of Stalin, a uh, few, but some, um, that she, she changed it or she only included initials so that they would be published. For example, the famous poem about Man Manderstam called Baronish, she actually took out the last four lines uh, because they were explicitly stating about the suffering poet in the regime. And the last was a, a praising poem. And the beauty of the poem was, of course, the tension in between the two. You, you reminded me that um, in her essay, Marina Svetaeva has an essay called Poets with History and Poets Without History. Right, right. And in this essay, do you remember she writes about Akhmatova? And she says that Akhmatova is a poet without history. And what she means by that is a poet without history is someone who arrives from the beginning fully formed. Right. A poet with history is someone who develops. And she reads the poem in which Akhmatova says, I put my right hand glove on my left, I put my right hand glove on my left hand. <laughs> and she goes, in that one gesture is the whole of Akhmatova. It's the most thrilling literary criticism I've ever read, I think this description of Akhmatova. Yes, she's uh, really talking about the, emotion, the emotional life of detail. Um, Manderstam, although he never wrote a formal essay, did uh, speak to others about Akhmatova. And he believed that Akhmatova was influenced by Russian prose, by pro prose writers like Chekhov, say, where some little detail would have an enormous significance. Like Chekhov would say, if there is a gun appearing in the first sentence, there's going to be a gunshot at the end of the story. Yeah, he, he said it. It's, um, it, her work begins at, as a glance at the psychological prose, mostly of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a kind of, you're absolutely right. It's a novelistic sense of detail that she brings to the lyric poem. Uh, I think. Um, Sometimes we read um, prose and we want to skip details to get to action, but in poetry, details are action. <laughs> That's all we have. <laughs> That's all we have. Um, do you want to say something about the Polish poets um, that uh, we have in this book? Miłosz, Herbert, 
Zimborska, Rozevich, is there one of them that speaks to you in particular? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, they all speak in different period, periods of life. Uh, from me, Yosh, one learns how to grow older. Uh, he's a kind of poet. I'm in my 40s now. I had to go back to the bookshelf and figure out what does it mean to be in one's 40s. Uh, a Hor a Horbert is an uh, amazing poet when you want to think about the role of an artist. Um, he really created himself that way using another tradition, Kavafis. Uh, but what I really want to say um, is kind of about the difference between Western modernism and East European modernism. Because on one side, um, they're all very sophisticated traditions. But something happened in Eastern Europe with all this public violence. Uh, you, revolutions, wars, uh, invasions, and so on, that modernists realize that they can't just, you know, wear a nice hat and a scarf and be a poet sitting in a Paris cafe. Um, they really needed to reach human next door. And that was very much true for Polish poets, as it was for Ahmadova who was standing in a prison line, and a woman standing next to her asked it, can you describe all this? And Ahmad will say it, I can. I think Miyosh in the witness of poetry says something like um, when you're lying on the ground during bombardment, um, a lot of the pretensions of style of poetry become secondary. You want then that was a kind Modernism in Polish poetry, especially because Polish poetry translates so well and Russian poetry sometimes doesn't translate so well. You can see it uh, explicitly in Polish poetry, the kind of modernism that's incredibly sophisticated and yet um, very relatable. You can give the Sava Szymborska's poem to somebody who never read poetry and they will completely relate to it. And that is Something that I keep coming back to is a great lesson in how um, to embrace humanity without giving up the art. I, I completely agree with you that one of the things that I found in this poetry is that they put human beings at the center. There's a tremendous essay by Gombrowicz, which is at the end of his journals called Against Poets. It's a very funny essay in which he attacks lyric poetry. But really what he's attacking is a certain kind of lyric poetry. What he's really attacking is the Mallarmé tradition of pure poetry. And he says in this essay that poets are lost as soon as they lose sight of human beings. And a great deal of 20th century sophisticated poetry has really lost sight of human beings. And the Polish poets, primarily I think because their country was occupied first by the Nazis and then by the Soviets, but not only for this reason, they also put human beings in their work in a way that's been very instructive to me and, and made me look for something more humane in poetry than you could find in Anglo-American modernism which was my tradition coming up. Should we read one of the poems? Do you think we have time, Ilya, to read, say, the Zimborska poem or the Rozevich poem? Sure. We, which we would you like to read? read? Why don't you read In the Midst of Life? Sure, sure. I have it's that. on page yeah, 110. Okay. Yeah, 110. Perfect. You want me to read it? Yeah, I'd love you to. Tadao okay. Chirajavich, in the midst of life. After the end of the world, after death, I found myself in the midst of life, creating myself, building life, people, animals, landscapes. This is a table, I said. This is a table. On the table is a bread, a knife. A knife is to cut bread. People to live on bread. 
Man must be loved. I studied night and day. What must be loved? I answered, man. This is a window, I said. This is a window. Beyond the window is a garden. In the garden I see an apple tree. The apple tree is in bloom. The blossoms fall, the fruits form, right? My father picks an apple. The man, that man picking the apple is my father. I sat on the doorway of my house. That old woman who is leading a goat by the rope is more unnecessary, more precious than the seven wonders of the world. Anyone whose instinct feels that she is not necessary is a mass murderer. This is a man. This is a tree. This is bread. People leave, eat to live. I repeat it to myself. It's important. Human life is of great import. The value of life. Outweighs the value of all things created by man. It's a great treasure. I kept repeating stubbornly. This is what I said. I struck the waves with my hand and took it to the river. What I said. Nice water. This is me. A man was told into the water. Told into the moon, the flower, the rain, told into the earth, the birds, the sky. The sky was silent. The earth was silent. If we heard the voice flowing from earth, water, and sky, it was the voice of an animal. Thank by you Marcus so Green. much for reading that poem, Ilya. So I love this poem. I think it was the first blow in a way of Polish poetry. Like this, um, this poem tries to imagine poetry again from the beginning. Like the world is coming to an end. I mean, the poem begins after the end of the world, after death. I found myself in the midst of life. And so what do you do then? And so this kind of poem tries to imagine poetry from the beginning again. And it's, he tries to reassure himself by going, this is a table. A table is for creating bread. This is a knife. A knife is for cutting bread. Um, and then because he's trying to reassure himself and reassure us about the value of the world. And there's the most radical statement here, which is so overstated, but I think he believes it. And you can see why after what he'd seen during the war, where he goes, he sees an old woman, he's sitting on the doorway and he sees a woman walking by um, and she's leading a goat, goat by the rope. And she says, she's more necessary and more precious than the seven wonders of the world. Anyone who thinks and feels that she's not necessary is a mass murderer. It's an incredible thing to say. Why do you think he states it so greatly? Why is it so extreme? Well, he is very much responding to Adorno. Um, Adorno, who revolts against high culture, says uh, high culture doesn't matter anymore because so much death happened. And here he is reclaiming poetry back. He's bringing the, element, the elements back. Um, he's naming the world in a in very much Adamic way, but not mythological, if you will. But I do kind of believe that this poem is still a kind of a spell casting. He's casting a spell on us, but also on himself. And it is on himself part that persuades me finally, because it's a very rhetorical poem. And I'm very allergic to rhetorical poems. But when I see him arguing with himself, persuading himself, not just trying to persuade me, I fall for it. I, I think your point is a very good one because 
the way that spells work in poetry is through incantation. Mm -hmm. And this is a very, even though it's so simple, it's a very incantatory poem. Mm -hmm. And so it puts you into some kind of a state. Mm -hmm. Even though what he's saying is sometimes very disenchanted. Right. Like when he's trying to say, man is very important. I kept saying man is very important. I mean, I think he keeps insisting because he's been seen in World War II that man is not very important. Yeah. And the way people have been treated is not very important. And so he's trying to assert the humanity behind the in, in, inhuman century. Well, it's, I'm also interested in the kind of a distance that he's creating on one side, he said, this is my father, this is an, a, a woman in my neighborhood working. But then he steps back right away and says, it's not just my father, it's a human being, it's a representative of a species. And it's almost like a biblical this that we see happening. You know, a human being is created and suddenly there's a family struggle, right? Uh, and this kind of back and forth of perspective is interesting because it's a very simple poem and yet so, much complication is happening in terms of perspective. This is, we don't really have time to discuss all these poets, but I think this is very representative of the half generation that we're talking about after Miwash, the half generation of Herbert, Rozevich, and Zimborska. Mm -hmm. They had the nickname the New Columbuses mm -hmm. because they were sort of recreating poetry again. Um, and you have this kind of conversation in their poetry between the individual life and the pull of what's happening in the community with, with, with the politics, because they can't ignore be, it. I don't expect an answer because we don't have much time. It would be interesting to ask if American poetry were, was to be re reinvented, what kind of reinvention would that be? That's a big question. That's a big question. But I think that um, one way to answer it is that um, the history of America, you know, as you know, I've been writing a book about American poetry. Yeah. And, and I think that the history of American poetry is a kind of family quarrel. Right. And so poets keep rewriting because there's an ideal at the basis of the poetry of democracy and poets keep trying to hold us to account because we don't live up to that ideal. And so this is really another subject, but I think that this is a way of answering your question, which is we keep trying to remake American poetry so that it will follow, that, so that American culture will live up to the idea of American society, which we have not lived up to, mm -hmm. which is the equality of souls. But yes, this is Polish poetry is a model because they, they had to answer this question. Should we move over to, to this side of the ocean? Sure. The way nice. you did? Since, since we're here anyway. Since we're here anyway. Um, I wonder if we should either, should we turn to either someone like Gerald Stern or Stanley Kunitz, or should we, because of time, turn to Georgia and our two friends who were in the book who've died, um, Thomas Lux and, and Anya Silver? That would be lovely. Why, why don't we do a poet from, from George Jason? Let's say that again. Uh, since we are presenting for, for Georgia Center of the book, yeah. we might as well um, talk since, about the Georgia poet. Right. Since um since you're you're in the position that Tom Lux used to teach in at Georgia Tech, and since he was a dear friend of both of ours. Why don't you read his poem, The People of the Other Village, and then I'll read the Anya Silver poem, Persimmon. Wonderful. It's on page 306. Thomas Lux, The People of the Other Village. The people of the other village hate the people of this village and would nail our huts to our hut our hats to our hats for refusing in their presence to remove them. Or staple our hands to our foreheads for refusing to salute them. If we did not hurt them first, mail them 
packages of rats make the floor at night with broken glass. We do this, they do that. They peel the learn from one of our brother's throats. We dive in one of their sisters. The quicks and pits they built for a good. Our amputation teams for a better. We train some birds to steal their wit. They send us exploding ambassadors of peace. They do this. We do that. We cancel our ship's imports. They no longer bought our blankets. We market the greatest poets when that had no effect. We parodied the way they dance. We did cast pain. So they, in turn, said our God was a leprous hairless. We do this, they do that. 10,000, 10,000 years, 10,000, 10,000. Brutal, beautiful, yeah. Thomas Fox. Wonderful, Ilya, thank you. Okay. Um, it's an amazing poem. Um, it's, it's very rare to have such a political poem that's so funny. Uh, uh, well, he is, but he is also very formal in so many ways. The structure is he, he makes fun by, by using form. He combines well, you know, repetition and tone, right? Yes, and you know, um, well, you know his, his work, he began as a surrealist. Right. Um, and there's a lot of surreal imagery here. But then he loved Horace right, right. And, and Horace's idea of the poet as a maker. Mm -hmm. And he has a poem about inspiration. He goes, oh, give me a break, mm -hmm. he says. Um, and this poem, I think you're right, is so carefully structured around these repetitions. We do this, we, they do that, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, it, may, it reminds me of Enrique Links, a poet from Chile. He has a poem called Torture Chamber. Uh, we, we had a similar kind of structure, uh, but Lux really kind of updates it to our moment in time. And what I love about this poem is that it is also self-criticism. It is not one of those poems that says, you're a bastard, but I'm wonderful. No, no, no. Everybody is bad in this poem. It's, I mean, he implicates us right. and himself because we go first. We do this, they do that. It's not they do that and then they do that and then back and forth. It's like, this is what happens when we do something and then they respond. It's so archaic, but it's also so contemporary. I mean, he wrote this poem in response to the Gulf War. Right. That's what infuriated him. But he carefully took out all those references. Mm -hmm. So it feels almost archaic or tribal in its sort of, this goes on and on and on. I like the joke when he says we make fun of their poet. Poets, yes. it doesn't make and they have no effect. And no one pays any no one pays any attention. But then when we make fun of how they dance, they don't like that. <laughs> I think it's really the, that, that's the funny thing. You mentioned the humor and we are laughing. And in the middle of a joke, we realize that we should should be crying. Yeah. This is Lux. Yeah, so. This is this is Lux. He takes the laughter right out of your throat right, right. and hits you. And that's, I think, how the poem, that's how this poem, but also most of his poems, his really good poems, operate in this way. They make you laugh, but behind them is a kind of understanding of history and a kind of, kind of wisdom about suffering. Mm -hmm. Because behind this is a kind of recognition of a, a kind of... I think a kind of hatred of war mm -hmm. and what war brings and the archaic attitudes that war brings. Um, let's turn because just for time's sake um, to, to a poem by Anya Silver. Um, because I, I want people to know her work. Um, all of her work 
I mean, she considered herself a witness to the experience of chronic and terminal illness. And all of her books were written um, under the sign of, of breast cancer. And she died really as much too young a woman. Young. Yeah. But she wrote remarkable poems. And she's one of the most moving contemporary Christian poets I know. And this is a religious poem. Um, but I don't want to dismiss it in any way as a religious poem. It's a completely felt, personally religious poem, sacred poem. It's called Persimmon. I place you by my window so your skin can receive the setting sun. So your flesh will yield to succulents, lush with juice. So the saints of autumn will bless your flaming fruit because cancer has left me tired. Because when I visit God's houses, I enter and leave alone. Not even in the melting beeswax and swinging musk of incense has God visited me, nor when I'm bowed or kneeled or sung. Because I found God instead when I've crouched in bathrooms, lain back for the burning of my sin, covered my face and cursed, persimmon, votive candle at the icon of my kitchen window, your four-petaled stem, the eye of God in the temple's dome, tabernacle of pulp and seed, dwelling place for my wandering prayers. I am learning from you how to praise, because when your body bruises and softens, you are perfected, because your soul, persimmon, is sugar. Beautiful poem. I think this is really an exceptional poem. And it's a poem written out of de desperate need. And one of the things I find so moving about it, I mean, as you know, it has this kind of st strategy borrowed from King James, mm -hmm. because, 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 this kind of anaphoric method. Um, but what's really striking religiously to me is that she's looking for God, but doesn't find God in places of worship. She says very explicitly, the church does not help her. Where does she find God in her own suffering? When I've crouched in bathrooms, lain for the burning of my skin, covered my face and cursed. That's when she finds it in this fruit. Yeah, I think it's very Don't Christopher me. Smart of her. Uh, yes. the, the, the way the Christopher Smart is, is looking at the images of the world and uh, finding God in the ordinary, in the cat, she's finding God in, in fruit. Why don't you say something about the incantatory method that Christopher Smart uses? Oh, well, I would have to steal from one of your other books to say that. <laughs> okay, um, well, I I'll yeah, say yeah. something, which is um, Christopher Smart is one of Ilya's and my favorite poets. He's an 18th century mystic. Um, and in this poem, Jubilate Agno, he uses the strategy because, because, because. And in one of the most beautiful sections, which is about his cat, Jeffrey, he uses the language of high prayer to discuss, to describe Jeffrey's ordinary actions. And it's so overstated that it has a kind of comic holiness. And I think that the, it's the small detail with the large description and the incantatory method that gives that borrowed religious poetry of Christopher Smart so much of its power. And I think Anya Silver is borrowing some of its power here from I would say Blake too, and the incantatory method of the religious poems of Blake and Smart, who are re re religious poets, but outsiders. They're, they're not way, orthodox religious poets. In, in a way, she felt probably as an outsider to what she wrote in her books um, about being a cancer survivor and the way a cancer is viewed in the society, the, the way the illness is viewed you're automatically becoming the other. So I then, in that way, she felt as an outsider too. And of course, she, 
Shiva, 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 Shiva was very much a reader of Ahmadava. So in her poem, she also spoke for other cancer survivors, the way Ahmadava spoke for mothers of people who were in jail. I think she became increasingly conscious of this role as people responded to her, her poems and she became a witness for this kind of experience and suffering. And I think it gives her poetry a kind of amplitude. And that she's an outsider as a woman, as a cancer patient and survivor, and also as a Christian poet, because that's somewhat unorthodox in our somewhat secular age. And I think in all those ways, she felt that she was an outsider. So, Joe, welcome back. Thank you so much, gentlemen. It's been absolutely fascinating. And, uh, you know, I, I've loved in the, the chat and in the, the Q&A that you know, everyone's sort of picking up on the themes of spell casting and incantation that, you know, the, the reading and the discussion have kind of led us to. And folks, don't forget, if you'd like to ask any questions, type them into the chat or type them into the Q&A feature and we'll definitely ask them. Um, but, you know, I do have to say, I, I want to thank you all for um, giving us a little bit of Tom Lux and Anya Silver. Um, you know, they, they did read on our stage several times at the Decatur Library. And I know I heard Tom read the village poem and I'm pretty sure Anya read the persimmon poem as, as well after I heard it, all of it. I was like, yeah, I, I do believe she read that one. And that was one of the last times she read with us as well. Um, but amazing Georgia poets that, that um, you know, should widely be read as well. But you know, what I, I, listening to you all talk about the Eastern versus the Western tradition, it, you know, it seems that, you know, the, the Polish poets, the, the, the sort of Russian poets, the, there is a greater sense of loss. You know, they, they kind of had to, you know, they lived amongst the rubble for so long, you know, I, I remember, you know, the sayings that, you know, Americans love to say that no one has ever invaded America. You know, the shores of America have never been invaded. We've never had to deal with someone occupying our land, you know, or forcibly coming in and, you know, trying to take our land and our homes away from us, you know, and, you know, maybe the only people that can really do that are like, you know, pe poets in New York or poet, you know, after 9-11 or, or poets on the Gulf Coast after Katrina that had to live with this devastation. So the loss almost becomes physically palpable around them. And it, you know, and a lot of times that we look at our loss is like, you know, being a cancer survivor or almost reflecting, you know, poets reflecting on what a loss is by looking at it from a, a, a third party almost. I would say that this is what American poets have had to confront in the um, in what you're talking about is the immaturity of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, imagine what Native American poets have had to confront along these lines where everyone denies that manifest destiny was a genocide. Or imagine African American poets as American poets having to say, you know, I'm here too. Um, as Langston Hughes does. And I think that in, in what I find in, um, in the hundred poems that I've chosen here, that American poets speaking from grief, many of them come from other traditions, but all of them are confronting a kind of popular culture that elides grief, that's unaware of communal suffering, that denies communal suffering, that ignores communal suffering, I mean, we don't want to live in a country where everyone's just trying to sell us something all the time. Um, and I think that these poets are trying to um, confront their own sorrows and their sadness in, in a country that um, doesn't recognize the, the kind of suffering that's all around us. But we're increasingly forced to recognize this um, after 9-11 which is one of the reasons so many people in poetry turn to the Eastern European poets. They turn to Akhmatova, they turn to Miłosz, they turn to W.H. Auden, they turn to W.B. Yeats um, because these poets, and they turn to Adam Zagievsky um, um, because he had recognized that the world is mutilated 
and that we were trying to praise something that had now been mutilated as we understood it too. But this optimism that we have, which is part of our American birthright, has always been shadowed by something more sorrowful, darker, um, more agonizing. And I think our poets are more aware of this maybe than our popular culture is. Excellent. Thank you, Edward. That, that, that truly, truly answers that question beautifully. Um, we did have Michael has, has asked the question that I typically ask folks about killing your darlings. And he said, what were poems 101 and 102, the poems that broke your heart, but you could not include? That's a good, that's, I mean, what poems was I not able to yeah, when you had to get it down to, you know, 100 poems instead of, the, you know, 101 poems to break your heart. That's a very good question because um, I don't know if I have an exact answer to that because there were some poems that I realized early on that I wouldn't be able to include because they're too long. For example, I love Whitman's poem, Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking, which is a tremendous poem in the shadow of death. But I, I, I knew I could not, I knew I could not include it because it's so long um, that I couldn't, I couldn't write about it and do it and do it justice. Also true about Dante, who's one of one of my heroes of consciousness. No way I could write about. I could write about Dante because it just is too steep a too steep a story. So, I'm afraid there's a practical dimension to my book that, but it was there from the beginning. So it's hard for me to think of what I was killing because I kind of knew from the beginning that there are many poet poems that have been so meaningful to me that I couldn't include them. But also in many poem, poets, like the Akhmatova is a perfect example. I love the poem in memory of MB. I don't love it more than Requiem, um, but I couldn't write about Requiem because it's such a strange long poem and people only know the preface, which is marvelous, but the whole poem is extraordinary and very weird. Um, it has more beginnings than any poem I've ever known. It has a a, a preface, a prelude, an invocation. I mean, it just keeps beginning over and over again. Um, so, but I knew that even though I love Requiem, it would take me, you know, 40 or 50 pages to write about it in a way that would be reasonable. And so that had to be, that had to be excluded. Excellent, thank you so much. So, um, and Michael, Thank you for your reply as well and the lovely conversation. Oh, hi, Michael. <laughs> hi, Michael. So actually, as we're, we're getting to the top of the hour, is there maybe one or two more poems that we'd like to just read and leave us all with for the evening? What do you have in mind, Ilya? Well, um, would you consider maybe reading some of the leading poets, say, uh, Obed by Victoria Chunk? That would be wonderful. Why don't you read Obit, The Blue well, Dress? Since uh, I think that poem is available online, I also put the poem in a chat. It will be the link so people can follow because of my accent. Um, if you have a book, the poem was on page 464, Obit, The Blue Dress. The Blue Dress died on August 6, 2015 along with the little blue flowers, all silent. When the petals look it up, now small pieces of dust, I wonder whether they burn in the dress or just the body. I wonder who lifted her up into the fire. I wonder if her hair brushed his cheek before it grew into a bonfire. I wonder what the sound of the body made as it burned. They dyed her hair for the funeral to black. She looked like a comic character. I, I waited for the next comic panel 
to see that speech bubble and what she may say. But her words never came and we were left with the stillness of a blown glass. The words ability of rain, the millions of little blue flowers, imagination is having to live in a dead person's future. Grief is wearing a dead person's dress forever. As you can see, it's a prose poem. Um, they, it begins in um, the way obituaries begin, right? These, uh, these died on that day and so forth. And then a weird description, there's these bubbles, there's a blue dress, and then it becomes an essay on grief. What is grief? It's imagination. But go ahead, please, I'm talking too much. There, there's something I think, I wouldn't say funny, but strange in the poem because it sets up, it's square like an obituary. It looks like a newspaper obituary and starts out like an obituary. But of course, what she includes in the poem is nothing that, you know, after the beginning, none of it would appear in obit an obituary. It all becomes a kind of association, really metonymically, because in describing her mother's blue dress, she focuses obsessively on her mother's blue dress and therefore also focuses on her mother. And it really becomes a kind of essay in grief, um, even though it poses as an obituary. And she keeps saying strange things that would never appear in a newspaper obituary, but would appear in a poem about grief. And it's got that tremendous last line, grief is wearing a dead person's dress forever. And what, a, what a line of walking and wearing the clothes of those who've come before us. Um, and it, has, it also has a humorous moment where she sees almost like a comic book panel above her mother's head, because we've all looked at that experience of looking at someone dead and thinking they don't look like themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and she has that moment where she goes, her hair is too black. She looks like a comic book character. But of course, then she realized it's not, it's her mother. And, um, and then they're left, she calls it, the blown glass, that extraordinary image of blown glass, which holds the breath. It's a marvelous poem, and you read it beautifully, Ilya. Edward, before we move on maybe to a, a final poem, we do have a question from Matthew uh, that I wanted to get in because it really ties in with this particular poem as well. Um, and Matthew is joining us from Northern Ireland. So thank you, Matthew, for staying up. We've had several guests from Great Britain. So we know what time it is and we know that you stayed up late for this. So thank you very much. Um, but he says he loved the discussion and the poems and mentions Claudia Rankine's Don't Let Me Be Lonely seemed to me to transcend grief by attempting to come to terms with a national state of mind post 9-11 by addressing it from a personal starting point. Do you believe that a successful poem always contains an element of grief as its kernel in order to transcend and transform such emotions? That's a wonderful observation. The word that I hesitate is, is, is always, because I don't wanna say that a poem always does anything. Because I think as soon as you say something about a poem always doing that, someone comes along and writes a poem that doesn't do that. Um, as soon as you say that a poem is something written in lines, Baudelaire comes along and writes a prose poem that's not written in lines. Um, so as soon as you say a poem is written in meter, Walt Whitman comes along and writes a poem in, in reverse. So I'm hesitant to say all poems transform grief. But what I will say is that there's never been a culture without poetry. And in every culture with poetry, there are, there is always two kinds of poems along with many others. But as far as I know from all the poetries that I've studied, um, including tribal poetries and oral poetries, there are two po kinds of poems always. One is the poetry of grief or lamentation. And this is the poetry that sends off the dead, that, that, that eases them on their passage into the other world. 
and that mourns over the fact that we lose things and people irreparably and tries to comfort us or heal us for that loss. Also in every poetry, there's a poetry of joy or celebration or excitement. Now, I believe that these are part of the same two sides of the same thing. And the reason for that is the poetry of joy or celebration um, is a poetry of ecstasy, but it's also something that celebrates the world and its transience. And it said, says, we celebrate because we're here and it's a piling up of particulars. So the reason I think these are two parts of the same thing and transform the same thing is one says we are transient, transient mortal beings and we should celebrate that right now, that we're here and that the world is alive in all its parts. And the other side of that is we're transient mortal beings and we grieve over the passage of time and the fact that we lose things we love. And so I would say most poems, I wouldn't say all poems, but I would say most poems tend to fall or intermingle aspects of these two elements of celebration or lamentation. And they fall in different, they fall on different sides of the divide, but they both have to do with our mortality. So we do have a, another question that I wanted to get to um, because we do have some folks joining us from all over the world tonight. So I kind of wanted to make sure that everybody got their question answered. Um, and this one comes from Alicia and she is joining us from Norway. Um, Ciao, so, Alicia. Um, thank you for staying awake. I believe Tusen Talk is thank you in Norwegian. So if it is, Tusen Talk, Alicia. Um, she says, thank you for a lovely conversation. Grief is universal, but it is so interesting to hear the nuances in these poems, the various approaches due to history. She sees Eastern poetry as endowed with history, while Western poetry is immersed in a presence. Is that correct? Is that, could she make that assumption? I mean, it's certainly true that um, the poetry of different Eastern European countries is very conscious of history, that American poetry in particular, the poetry of the New World has not been traditionally, I would say. That there is a conversation in with the historical surroundings that gives a kind of depth to the poetry of the older world. What I'd say is that the American or North American poetry um, is a little more complicated because the overall arch of that I think is a correct observation. But there are many poetry, many examples within this of poets who are conscious of something much deeper and older. For example, Two of my favorite poets from Latin America, which is part of the Americas, Cesar Vallejo and Pablo Neruda, are aware of archaic values. If you think about the heights of Machu Picchu and Neruda's great poem, Canto General, you'd say Neruda's in conversation, not with contemporary world as much as the, with also comparing it with the history of Inca civilization. And Vallejo is certainly informed by indigenous writing in Peru and, 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 and a very ancient civilization. So although the, the, the culture is, is, is sort of the historical surrounding is somewhat different, these poets do have a deep ground, but they don't have, I'd say Latin American and North American poetry doesn't have the same sort of texture that you get in Russian poetry or in Polish or in Hungarian or Romanian poetry. Ilya? Yeah, if I may, I would also add that um, if you have poets like Robert Hayden who uh, write an amazing poetry of history, uh, Middle Passage is a great long poem about history. Um, one that can certainly live up to the best of Eastern European poets about history. 
Um, so for every observation, there is another observation. Yeah. And that is the beauty of having a conversation. Yeah, I mean, Ezra Pound defined an epic as a poem including history. Right. And, um, and so you'd say one strain of modernism, of Anglo-American modernism, which would include the cantos and, um, and the wasteland and Middle Passage, which I agree with you is a great American poem, and, and Hart Crane's The Bridge, and William Carlos Williams' Spring and All. These are books um, that include history, and so they have a kind of epic sweep that many lyric poems don't. Excellent. Well, as we wrap up, gentlemen, is there a, one more thought or maybe one more final poem that we want to close out with this evening? Ilya, do you have a final poem? I'm, I'm sort of, I think we've, we've done a lot of work here. We don't want to tire everyone out. Um, I will follow directions. If, if you want to do one more poem, uh, it might be interesting to finish on uh, the world, the war works hard by Dunya yeah, Michael. I, I love that poem. Since we read the Lux poem about the Gulf War, I think it'd be great to have a poem from an Iraqi poet right, right, right. writing about the war works hard. Why don't you read it, Ilya? Sure. Page 327. Okay, thank you. Um, and for those of you who have a hard time with my accent, the poem is called The War Works Hard, and you can easily find it online as well, so you can follow along. Ilya, war... before you read it, maybe I'll say something about it so yeah, we please. can just end on the poem this time. When, um, I wrote to Dunya about this poem and asked her if there's anything she could tell me about it that I wouldn't know from reading it. And she said that when she was in Iraq, her family had a war room. Her mother called it the war room. And whenever there was bombing, they would go into the war room. And that's how she got the idea to treat the war as any other worthwhile human activity which I think is also makes this poem so funny and poignant. Um, and also gives us the perspective from the Iraqi perspective on the war and the endless series of wars in the Middle East. So anyway, Ilya, maybe you could read it now. Thank you. The War Works Hard by Dunya Michael, translated by Elizabeth Winslow. How magnificent the war is, how eager and efficient. Early in the morning, it wakes up the sirens and dispatches ambulances to various places. The wind corpses through the air, rolls stretches to the wounded, summons rain from the eyes of mothers, digs into the earth, dislodging many things from under the ruins. Some are lifeless and glistening, others are pale and still throbbing. It produces the most questions in the minds of children, entertains the gods by shooting fireworks and missiles into the sky. So smiles in the fields and reaps, punctures and blisters, urges families to emigrate, stands beside the clergyman, and they curse the devil, poor devil. He remains with one hand in the ceiling, fire. The war continues working day and night. It inspires tyrants to deliver long speeches, awards medals to generals and deans to poets. It contributes to the industry of artificial limbs, provides food for the flies, adds pages to the history books, achieves equality between the killer and the killed, teaches lovers to write letters, accustoms young women to wait in fields and newspapers with articles and pictures, builds new houses for the orphans, invigorates the coffin makers, gives grave diggers a pat on the back, and paints a smile on the leader's face. The war works with unparalleled diligence. 
yet no one gives it a word of praise. Ilya, I love the moment where she goes and it gives a theme to poets. <laughs> <laughs> She's making a sort of joke for herself right. here, but then she moves on. I mean, it's such an original way to think. It's, it's such an original anti-war poem. Right. You know, she once said that um, somebody asked her, and we talked about it earlier, about 9-11 and all that, and somebody asked her um, about the difference between uh, society in here and Iraq. And she said, well, you know, in Iraq, we say something, and then they censor us. And in America, we censor ourselves before we say something. Um, it's very smart. And, and that is also kind of thinking that you find in her poems too, except that she does it with images, but there is always a kind of tension that is happening. The censors are always at work inside us. Yeah. And, and I think that um, breaking free, she, that's a very astute observation, of course, by her about breaking free of the internal censors. That, 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 that where we stop ourselves from telling the truth as we as we understand it. Well, thank you so very much, gentlemen. Um, you know, from the chat and all of the questions, everyone truly enjoyed how insightful and how beautiful these poems were this evening. I thank you all for joining us, allowing us into your homes tonight, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much um, for being here with us. Once again, if you would like to order a copy of the book, Karis Books and More is our bookseller this evening. We thank you in advance for supporting our independent bookstores. Once again, Ilya, Edward, thank you so much for this beautiful reading, Edward, for this wonderful book uh, that I am sure is going to find a home on many, many bookshelves. Thank you so much, everyone. We will see you all again very, very soon. Have a Thank wonderful you, everybody. Life. Thank you, Ilya. I love you. And you incredibly generous of you. Thank you. I love you, Ilya. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you all.